Hi guys, so let's talk about race condition in this video. So this video is in continuation to the multi-threading video which I had published yesterday. So I would recommend you guys to check that video out as well. But anyways, let's continue from that point. So before uh, discussing about what race condition is, let me actually show you one C++ program. So this is a C++ program and it has, uh, and there is a static int variable, this global static variable shared where whose initial value is 1000. Now, this is a function which has void return type and all it does it, uh, is that it iterates, it runs a for loop for 1000 times and it basically increments the shared variable. And then in whichever thread this function is running, we just, after incrementing the variable, after each increment of the shared variable, we sleep for five microseconds. And in int main function, what I'm doing is that I've created two threads, thread t1 and thread t2. And in both these threads, I'm running this function. And uh, then I eventually do t1 dot join, t2 dot join, dot join. And eventually I print the sh uh, value of the shared variable. And if you see this program, so you might think that, okay, initial value of shared variable is 1000. And then uh, this function increments the value of shared, increments the value of shared variable by 1000 only. And since this function will be run two times in two different threads, the final value of shared variable, which should come out, it should be 3000 because initial is 1000 and then 2000 is added to it. But if you run this program, you will actually see different behaviors each time. Like uh, I did one run of this program and you can see the value of shared variable, which is printed is 2990. If I do another run, some other value will be printed. You see now the value which is printed is 2998. And if I do another run, I mean, again, this program has unpredictable behavior. Now the correct value is printed, but this piece of code actually has a race condition. Like now you can see it is printing 2997. So how is there a race condition? So race condition is like this, that uh, what is happening that this is a shared variable, okay? And this is shared among all the threads in which this variable is accessed because this is a global static variable and we are doing unprotected access of this variable. So let me like uh, here it seems to you that this is only one instruction like if you're doing plus plus shared variable. So it is only one instruction in terms of C++ code. But what happens that when the program is basically when you compile the program and eventually the binary which is generated, it has machine instructions. Okay, now those machine code or those machine instructions are executed on your CPU. Now, what seems to you a single instruction here might be multiple instructions in the machine when it is when this particular code is converted into the machine code. So if you see what could be the case is that the initial value of shared variable is 1000. I'm just showing you one increment, how race condition can occur. Now, what corresponding machine instruction might have been generated? Like there are multiple possibilities of what could have been generated, but one possibility is this, like every CPU has some register. So CPU can basically, like when this thread one is running, let's say it is running on some CPU one. So uh, in CPU one, we store the CPU one basically stores the variable value of the shared variable in its register, in its register one. Okay. So in register one, it has the value 1000. Now it increments the value that is it does plus plus register one. And then register one has value 1001. And in thread two, be, before this, uh, the value which is there in register one, before the CPU could write this value from its register to the main memory where the shared variable is present or to the address where the shared variable is present. What happens that thread two reads the value of shared variable from the memory because these threads are running in parallel. So interleaving of instructions might occur. Now thread two read, read the value as thousand as well, because right now still the value of shared variable is thousand only. Now at this moment, CPU one wrote the value from its register to the uh, address of the shared variable, which is basically in the main memory. And then thread two has the variable thousand only in its register it does the increment of that and it eventually writes that to the main memory as well so you can see that the value of shared variable is still 1001 and the correct result would have been that the value of shared variable must have been 1002 because we are doing unsynchronized access so this interleaving of instructions could occur as i said like we it seemed to us we were doing doing only one single instruction which was plus plus shared variable but uh, the machine code which is generated might have multiple instructions for which seems to you a single instruction in the C++ code. And why it happens is because how the architecture of computer is uh, made up. Uh, because uh, let me show you how the computer architecture or what happens behind the scenes. So this 
I am showing this box which you see, which where we have written P1. It is actually a CPU core one, and this is a CPU core two. Now again, race conditions and interleaving of instructions can also occur on one CPU, but I am just showing two CPUs for clarity of understanding. Okay, so these are two processors. Now each processor has instruction cache and data cache. So, and the, your cache is hierarchical. Now let's focus on data cache only because that's where all the data or all the values of your variables are stored. So each processor has L1 cache and it has L2 cache. Now it I'm showing the x86 architecture here, but for Intel, but uh, this can be different depending on different processors and different architectures. So as I said, cache is hierarchical. Hierarchical. Each processor has L1 cache. You can see P1 and P2 both have L1 cache. Each processor has L2 cache. I have drawn the L2 cache box a bit bigger than L1 cache because size of L2 cache is usually bigger than l1 cache then we have not usually but almost always bigger then we have l3 cache which is not per cpu it is actually shared between all the cpus and then we have the ram okay so let's say this was your shared variable i am denoting it by x here whose value let's say initial value is 10 it is stored here at ram now 31 is running on processor p1 32 is running on processor p2 and they want to increment this variable both of them want to increment this variable so if in case you are doing unsynchronized access of this shared memory location so what would happen like 31 which is running on processor p1 will basically read the value of this x so it will read from ram it will load into l3 cache l2 cache and l1 cache as well and then before it could do the increment and write it back at the ram 32 which was running on processor p2 also write the value of xs10 loaded it in l3 cache l2 l1 cache and did the increment now both of these threads have the value of x as 11 and now they will write it to the main memory so as you can see like because of this interleaving of instructions the value which should have come out to be 12 came out to be 11 so this is what we call race condition and this as i mentioned happens because how because the machine code which is generated is not what looks to you in your c++ code or any pro programming language code and also because how the computer architecture is uh, basically designed and you can see here like i have this is a predator laptop which is a windows laptop and you can see like i am here in the cpu tab i also have l1 l2 l3 cache and you can see that size of l1 cache is 256 mb l2 cache is bigger and l1 cache it is 1 mb and l3 cache is the biggest which is 8 mb l3 cache is shared between all processors and usually l1 cache is the fastest l2 cache is slower than l1 cache l3 cache is the slower amongst all the caches and ram is the most slowest uh, memory i mean accessing ram is very very slow it wastes a lot of cpu cycles so now the question is how we can uh, make this access synchronized okay so again one thing is that here also comes another term which is called critical section so critical section is that section of your program which accesses the shared variables okay so this is or shared data you can say or shared file so this is actually a critical section so to avoid race conditions what you can do is basically you can do synchronized access and synchronized access can be done by taking locks so let me introduce you the concept of mutex so you can actually have a mutex and whenever you are accessing the shared variable you should actually take a lock so how you can take a lock is like this let's uh, create a mutex variable m and let's do a m dot lock and then when you are done accessing the critical section you should release the lock which is m dot unlock so what happens in this case is that uh, whichever let's say thread t1 started running before thread t2 so it would take the lock it would then read the value of shared variable let's say at that moment thread t2 also started running now it will try to acquire the lock now since thread t1 has the lock it cannot acquire the lock so it guarantees that this shared variable will be accessed by only one thread at a time so when thread t1 has done accessing shared variable it has basically incremented the value and returned it back in this memory location it will release the lock and then another th other threads which are waiting on this lock can actually take this lock so this is how you can prevent race conditions now it is generally uh, advised that you should not use mutex like this like you should not call lock and unlock you should rather use a lock guard because let's say you did a lock here and you forgot to do unlock now in this case what will happen that thread t1 will acquire the lock and it will never release the lock and other threads cannot acquire this lock so like other threads will get blocked so that's why it is not generally uh, advised to take use mutex like this because someone can actually forget to forget to unlock and 
this can be an uh, unintentional mistake as well let's say you have a code which has a lot of branches and a lot of early returns a lot of places where you are throwing exceptions so in that case you have to make sure that in every uh, like in every line of code where you are returning or you are basically throwing an exception you should remember to unlock the mutex in case you forget to do that then that thread will indefinitely hold the mutex so what you can do to avoid that is that c++ has this concept of std log guard so you should actually take a mutex like this like you should do use a std log guard and then pass it this m so what this basically does is that std log guard is basically a rai object which rai is called resource acquisition is initialization so what it does that here you are creating a here you are creating an instance of std log guard it is a template class now in its constructor since this is a class its constructor will be called when you are creating the instance so in its constructor it will do call m dot log so it will take the log and here like at this point std log guard which is a local variable will go out of scope so its destructor will be called so in its destructor it releases the log it basically calls m dot unlock mutex dot unlock so that makes sure that every time uh, Basically, it makes sure that lock is always released or the mutex is always unlocked. So this is how I advise people to use uh, std log guard. So as I said, like, let me also show you how the basic implementation of std log guard looks like. So it is like this. You can also create your own std log guard, which is a RIA object. So it looks something like this. You can have a class. So it will have a private member of std mutex and it could be of reference type. So it would have this. And then what in its constructor, it would take the lock uh, here. It would call m dot lock and here in its destructor, it would call m dot unlock. So this is just a basic implementation. I mean, it has some other things as well. It has some other things as well, like uh, one second. So it would be something like this, yeah. So as I said, like this is just a basic implementation, but log guard is basically a template class. You can check its out, check its implementation in the GC, how GCC has implemented it. But anyways, so I think that's was all I had for this particular video. Thank you guys for watching. Please do not forget to like, subscribe, and comment, and I'll see you all next time.